my next topic is a discussion of adaptation in reform of Islamic law. There is a chapter, chapter 12 in this book, my book, Sharia Law in Introduction. And my discussion is basically a rehash of what I have written. I will be looking at uh, four aspects of the reform of Islamic law. Basically, the 20th century, but I will be looking back to put uh, the whole of this discussion into perspective. Then I look at the writing methodology and styles like the encyclopedias, for example, of 20th century, codification movement, and then research, emergence of universities. To discuss the adaptation and reform of Islamic law, we need to look back into historical background so that we can then identify our subject matter a little clearly. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll be looking at six phases of the de in the development of fiqh. This is really historical discussion. The first five phases I will be very briefly just drawing a profile. And then the last phase will be the 20th century reform of Islamic law. Uh, the first five phases of uh, the formative uh, stages of Islamic law, of course, begin with the uh, uh, prophetic period, uh, when the Prophet uh, started his mission. The Quran was revealed and the Prophet explained the Quran through his own exemplary conduct in Sunnah. That period lasted from 610 common era to 632. At that time, and the subject was not Islamic law that was so much in focus. It was uh, a dogma in belief in the moral values of Islam, not so much the fiqh as we are concerned with uh, today. And then during that time also the practical rules are of Sharia actually unfolded in the second period after the Prophet's migration to Medina. Ijtihad was not really exercised at that time by others as the Prophet himself would, uh, was able to deliver the rulings of issues directly. The second phase is that of the companions that lasted again for 31 years, 632 to 661. They were also focused on the study of the Qur'an and Sunnah collection of Hadith in expanding the scope of the Ahkam. Uh, there were the beginnings of uh, the Fiqh uh, as a subject in discipline. The companions have made a lasting impact on the development of Islamic law, uh, partly because they took a comprehensive approach, a rational approach to the understanding of the Sharia and they looked into the effect, the rationale, the objectives, as well as uh, the reading of the text and uh, consultative approach that they took towards the application of uh, uh, the textual rulings of uh, Sharia to particular issues. Uh, the Khulafa Rashidun, the first rightly guided caliphs, they are known for their distinctive contribution to the development of Islamic law. Then the third phase is the era of the successors or the tabi'un that lasted uh, from 661 to 750, about 90 years. And during this time, the territorial domain of Islam expanded. In Islam, and the Sharia came into contact with other older uh, traditions and this is the time when issues of greater complexity were addressed. Then the scholastic development, proponents of uh, tradition and proponents of personal opinion, Ahl al-Hadith, Ahl al-Ra'ya, they emerged in 
Mecca in Medina, the Ahl al Hadith in the Iraqi cities of Kufa in Basra, which was the center of uh, scholastic studies orientated more toward the exercise of personal opinion. It was during this time also that Shia Mazhab emerged, the jurisprudence of Shia jurisprudence started to uh, be formulated this time. The fourth phase of the development of fiqh is known as the era of ijtihad. Uh, and this is known to uh, have lasted two centuries, 750 to, seven, to 950. And the uh, four leading mazhabs, the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, and Hanbali emerged during this time. Uh, they made contributions to the sources of the Sharia as well as the Fiqh, uh, the Hanafis, and they are known to have contributed the uh, Qiyas, Istihsan, and Urf, and others have in their turn, uh, their turn made contributions to the development of both the sources of the law and the subject matter of Fiqh. And it was Imam al Shafi who attempted to reconcile these two approaches of the Ahl al Hadith and Ahl al Raya into a combined approach. And he is known to have acquired this uh, name Nasir al Ummah, the Sunnah, Nasir al Sunnah, the champion of the Sunnah. He articulated the legal theory of Usul al Fiqh. He lived uh, most of his lifetime in Baghdad, but in the last five years uh, he traveled and domiciled in, uh, in Egypt uh, and uh, he st established a new mazhab uh, because he encountered the customs of Egyptian society so different to that of the Iraqi society that he uh, changed many of his original fatwas. And the Hanbali mazhab Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, he died 855, common era. Uh, he contributed uh, the Hanbali school to the theory of contract and also to Istishab. And uh, the Zahiri school also, uh, Ibn Hazm al-Zahiri, died the same year, 855, as Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Uh, and uh, the Hanbali school was declining, almost becoming extinct until the 18th century, the emergence of the Wahhabi movement in Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab that gave it a fresh impetus and revived the Hanbali school mainly through the readings of the works of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al jawziya his disciple. And uh, these mazahib now apply to this day, all in different geographical zones. In the fit era is the era of uh, imitative scholarship, the era of taqlid or imitation, which consists mainly of the institutionalization of the existing doctrines and the uh, scholars began themselves and occupied themselves with uh, writing commentaries and glosses in not so much the exercise of original thinking in ijtihad. And this is the, long, the longest period in the history of Islamic law, lasting right until the 20th century, saw the, and the collapse of the Abbasid and Ottoman Empire, the emergence of the West as military power, and then colonialism and an expansion of Western uh, legal and judicial doctrines into the Muslim lands. And uh, so much so that the fiqh in Sharia generally uh, was sidelined. And, uh, and so was the link between the fiqh in the realities of social life, and that is why that ijtihad in original thinking suffered a new blow by through the domination of Western law and doctrine in Muslim countries. 
And lastly, the second phase in the adaptation and reform of Islamic law begins with this the onset, the dawn of 20th century in, in the hands of Jamaluddin al-Afwani Muhammad Abdu and his disciple uh, Muhammad Rashid Rida. And the uh, call, a renewed call for the revival of Ijtihad through recourse directly to the original sources uh, of Islam and uh, then followed uh, two world wars and, and the collapse of colonialism and uh, then the rise of nationalism and independence movement in the Muslim lands. And uh, then we have this Islamic resurgence and revivalism, the demand for the revival of the Sharia into the fabric of law in governance in Muslim lands that were dominated by colonial powers. There was this demand and for, for decades we have seen a mass movement and a mass demand for the revival of their own heritage in the Sharia. There, but there was a contrary opinion mainly by and these Western educated that the Sharia does not offer a feasible alternative to constitutional theories in some aspects of Western law. Uh, the Sharia has fallen behind social reality. But uh, then we see the emergence of constitutionalism and promulgation of constitutions in Muslim countries, declaring, for example, Islam as the state religion and also Sharia as the source of law and legislation in their respective countries. We saw also a codification, codification of the fiqh and uh, in a new form, in a new style. The fiqh books, uh, they were written in their own ways, the, with poor classification and not uh, addressing the demands and realities of uh, modernity. They were also a little too complex perhaps in some ways. The new demand was that we also depart from this scholastic orientation, the mazhab orientation of the fiqh. And uh, countries that uh, retain the common law tradition like Pakistan, Malaysia, Sudan, they combine this practical approach with the study of fiqh uh, and uh, the kind of uh, merger of fiqh with uh, parliamentary legislation as well as judicial, judicial precedent. Codification became as an earnest engagement, codification of Islamic law in many countries, in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, the Egyptian scholar Abdul Razak al-Sanhuri died in 1971. He is contributed to the legislation processes, uh, especially the emergence of civil courts, and he adopted a mixed approach, combining Western doctrines with those of the Sharia. and. Um, and then we see also movements uh, in different parts of the Muslim world uh, that had characteristics of their own in the development in their approach to the reform of Islamic law. But uh, when discussing codification, the Ottoman Mujalla that was uh, composed and authored by the ulama of Turkey in 1876, uh, consisting of 1850 articles compiled into 16 chapters in an introduction. It was the first organized codification of the Islamic law of transaction, excluding Islamic family law, that remained influential uh, for many, many decades to come. And uh, soon after that, Turkey promulgated the Family Rights Act 
17, which expanded the scope, whereas the Mujalla was based mainly on Hanafi jurisprudence. Turkish Family Rights Law of 1917, they took from the other schools also, not only relied on the Hanafi. So this was a new development to expand the scope of legislation in codification. And uh, also another dimension of the same opening is that now reliance is being made um, on the opinion of individual scholars and jurists and not um, always on the rulings of the established mazahe. The Syrian law of personal status 1953 started a new beginning and that was the beginning of ijtihad through statutory legislation. Whereas earlier, uh, these were the fiqh works we are seeing, but now ijtihad uh, finds its place in the working of parliamentary assemblies. And then we see in mid-20th century in countries like uh, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Iraq, Pakistan, and they introduced uh, civil codes or uh, family uh, personal status laws attempting reforms of uh, the Islamic family law in certain areas uh, like uh, polygamy, like divorce, offering new interpretation to the original data of the Quran. 20th century has seen a progressive a movement in demand for the reform of Islamic law in the expansion of ijtihad not to be confined to any particular school but to draw from the wider sources of Sharia as well as the contribution of the Mazahib. But not just that but the contribution of modern scholars, not only even of Sharia scholars but scholars in different other disciplines that are equally important for the progress of law in society. Then we also see in some of uh, the legislation that uh, came about a consolidated approach of both the traditional and modern opinion in contributions. The Judean Civil Code 1976 is a good example adopted by United Arab Emirates in Sudan, for example. And uh, now the effort to uh, formulate a unified civil code for the Arab world, for example. Then in Pakistan we see the emergence of a slightly different movement, and that is to uh, bring into conformity the existing legislation, even from the colonial times with the Sharia of Islam, with the rulings of the Qur'an and Sunnah. And uh, this became the principal task of the constitutional body in Pakistan. In the early 1950s, Council of Islamic Ideology was given this task within five years to look into all the statutory codes and identify those which uh, were contrary to Sharia. And uh, after five years, uh, they found that only 10% of the existing laws showed some divergence from the Sharia and therefore reforming of some of those uh, laws. In Pakistan, it was a gradual approach, but the Sudani Sudan took a rather sudden approach and not case by case. Therefore, some of their legislation, like the Penal Code of 1983, was less than successful. In the Civil Law 1984 of Sudan, uh, confined mainly to some, was confined to some areas of the Sharia and not comprehensive enough. Then we see this uh, movement that uh, the basic principle of Sharia was permissibility of all that that was not contrary to Islam and its doctrine. Yet we have, we now see that Western doctrines can be taken so long as they are not contrary 
to Sharia. But uh, scholars like uh, Hassan Turabi and Jamaluddin Atiyah, they have warned that uh, liberal import of uh, the laws of uh, Western origin, even in the areas of commerce and industry and economics, uh, should be um, with care and not uh, that contradict the basic underlying uh, philosophy and objectives of uh, the Sharia. Another movement that mentions a brief mention is the formation, the compilation of the encyclopedias of fiqh and that uh, of uh, 20th century origin. And the law reform movement and legislation we mentioned, they were selective, of course, of certain areas. But we need, there was need for consolidated easily accessible presentation of the Sharia that could be used as the tools for Ijtihad and therefore the proposition by the OIC and other Muslim countries to come up with the encyclopedias of Fiqh. We now have the Encyclopedia Mausua Fiqhiyah of Kuwait in 45 volume started in 1971 and already coming to conclusion. Egypt started its own encyclopedia of Fiqa and so did Syria, but uh, they were discontinued and others have also made similar attempts. The approach here is that they are no longer scholastic. They are not based on one. The encyclopedia of Kuwait, for example, uh, give the eight mazhabs, including the Zwahiri, Zaidi, Ibadi, and Jafari, in addition to the four existing mazhab. Yet we move further. The encyclopedias were an uncritical uh, reproductive effort, although very valuable, but now we uh, need, uh, the need was felt for a better preparation for ijtihad and therefore the emergence of the fiqh or Islamic law academies uh, that exercise collective ijtihad. Many conferences were formed in several fiqh academies, international fiqh academies. There are two in Saudi Arabia, one in Jeddah, one in Mecca. And, uh, the Fiqh Academies of Jeddah have representatives for all Muslim countries. India and Pakistan have their own similar Fiqh Academies and Sharia Academies. Then institutions of Islamic research emerged in Islamic universities and uh, uh, issues of particular concern, test tube babies, artificial insemination, organ transplant, time of Salat in Antarctica and so on. These are being studied and fatwas are being delivered and uh, the Fiqh Academy resolutions in fatwa are also attempted with the participation of expert opinion outside the Sharia. Experts are invited into different. Then Pakistan gave it a constitutional found foundation through the formation of the Council of Islamic Ideology of I mentioned. Malaysia also has a fatwa council, the federal level uh, that uh, all the muftis uh, sit in for deliberate over issues of contemporary and topical concern. And now the last uh, area of development is uh, Islamic uh, banking and finance they also have their sitting Sharia scholars and advisors. In the area of teaching and research, we have seen the emergence of Islamic universities in teaching in the uh, university course format, focus research, master's degree and PhD research. They have taken different approaches, sometimes new disciplines of Sharia, like Islamic constitutional law, Islamic economics, Islamic banking and finance, they have emerged uh, and their uh, the attention is given not only to 
scholarship of the mazahib, but individual scholars and all those who have contributed. And finally, the teaching of Islam in the West is still remains theoretical, although research has widened its scope, remains fairly overcritical of, you know, of Islam in the Sharia, although there was some adjustment in balance inside until the 9-11 uh, attacks came and the gains that were made perhaps were set back. And there was uh, also the in Malaysia and certain other countries Islamic law courses in degree programs introduced even in non-Muslim Asian countries like Thailand and Philippines and India they offer full courses on Fiqh and Sharia and uh, Yet another aspect that is mentioned, worth mentioning, is Islamization program emerged in Pakistan and Sudan. Now they want the whole of their legal st structure and all the laws applied in the land to be consistent in conformity with Islam on a systemic basis. And then we have now a closer nexus between fiqh and parliamentary legislation. This is the result of the demands that we have seen for reform. Contributions were made through the fatwa collection by many ulama of Egypt, the retired Sheikh of Azhar, Shaltut, Mahraza, Tantawi. Uh, even the scholar Qaradawi, they have come up with volumes of their contributions and their fatwas. And, uh, some of the courts, the Supreme Courts and the Federal Sharia Courts of Pakistan, they have made important decisions that have reformulated some aspects of the Sharia and it is still continuing work. We have seen adaptation and reform of Islamic law into various phases and it seems that the demand has grown even wider. That was the discussion briefly of 20th century reforms of Islamic law.